representing the ministry of Emmaus uh, in Canada. And Emmaus exists for the purpose of encouraging people to study the Word of God. That's the only reason we exist. And increasingly we find there's a need for that. Because unfortunately, often Christians are biblically illiterate. They might be highly educated in every other area, but not in terms of Bible knowledge and foundation. And it's so important that we have a true, proper biblical understanding. That we are drawing our worldview, our understanding of life and eternity from the Bible and not from society, not just from what other people say. The Bible is so key. But here's one of the difficulties that people have when they read the Bible. The Bible is not all peaches and cream and sugar. The Bible has bad news. And the Bible describes who human beings are and how we have sinned and fallen. The Bible has many statements and explanations that are not pretty as it describes who you and I really are. And people stumble over that. I remember a number of years ago speaking to somebody in downtown Johannesburg in South Africa, and he was very offended that I told him that he was a sinner and that like a sheep he had gone astray. He said, don't you dare compare me to a silly sheep. I'm not a sheep. And I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. I really try my best. I try to be a, a nice person. And to try and get him back from his cultural understanding of who and what he was as a human being to a biblical understanding, God's perception of him, proved very, very difficult. He did not want to hear it. People stumble over the bad news of the Bible. When John the Baptist came on the scene, one of his first words to his people, the nation of Israel, was repent. And they didn't like it. Repent? What do you mean repent? I don't need to repent. I'm doing just fine. He said, no, you need to confess your sins. You need to repent. You need to acknowledge where you've gone astray, how you've gone astray, that you've disobeyed the Lord. You are in a position of rebellion against God. You are not walking in His ways. And they didn't want to hear that message. You turn to the book of Acts and you find that in all the preaching of the apostles, they always bring it down to the basic issue of we as people have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are in a position of spiritual poverty and bankruptcy. And we are in great danger eternally because of our sin. Because we are out of relationship with God. Therefore, we need that relationship with God restored. But there's only one way. Not all religions lead to God. Not every philosophy and worldview and idea is true. There's truth and there's error. There's lies and deception and then there's truth. And the apostles, as they preached that message very, very clearly, immediately people were upset by that message. And, and people reacted in anger and frustration against the bad news of the gospel. But you know, the Bible never just gives bad news for the sake of giving bad news. The Bible gives bad news because it is the means, the path to healing. If I went to a doctor and the doctor looked at me and examined me and he said, you know, as he, as he looks at the results of the test, well, you have cancer. And he's thinking to himself, I know what to do to remove this cancer and give chemo treatment for this person to be healed and restored to a normal life. But, I don't like giving bad news to people. I just like giving good news. So instead of telling me the truth, he says, you're fine. Just go home, enjoy your life. Everything's peachy, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Is that a good doctor? No, that's an awful doctor. That's a deceptive doctor. Is he being kind to me by giving me that quote-unquote, you know, easy good news? No, he's not being kind or loving or compassionate to me at all. He is withholding the solution that I need to my physical problems. The Bible gives us bad news to confront us with our need so that we will embark on the pathway of good news. The Bible starts right back at the beginning in Genesis and it tells us about God. 
that He created, that He made everything. This world, this universe, is not an accident of time and chance. It's a specific, special creation of God. It is ordered. It is not haphazard. It is not random. God made all things that are. And He made human beings, anthropos, man. He made us as very special beings, made in the image of of God. We are unique. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are very, very special. And we were made in God's image for fellowship with God, for relationship with God, to, to know, know Him and walk with Him, with him and, and enjoy Him, him and, and, and to, to, to be in that close, in an intimate relationship with our Creator. Creator. And that's, and that's what, what we were designed, designed for, to, to enjoy Him and love Him and worship Him. The bad news is that sin came in, disobedience came in. The human race, through our first ancestors, Adam and Eve, decided that they knew better than God. God said, here's the garden, here's everything that you can enjoy, but I'm going to put one test before you. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You don't need it, you don't want it. If you do, there are terrible consequences. Don't go there. And of course... That's what mankind went to. You know, it's like if anytime you see a, a, a sign, wet paint, what does everybody do? Why is that? Right? Keep off the grass. Got to walk on that grass. Right? Anytime you say to a little kid, don't do that, as soon as you turn your back, they're going to do it. Right? Okay, here's a fresh batch of cookies. I put them there to cool on the, on the island in the kitchen. Okay, now don't touch those. Well, you don't even have to turn halfway away and that little hand is going up for the cookies, right? Amazing. That nature, unfortunately, now that we have is this bent towards doing the opposite of what God has declared, of what God says to us. And, and we're in a very, very difficult position. Through sin, through disobedience, you and I are coping with physical death. We're all moving to that. And every day of the week, every hour, every minute, there are people around about us who are dying. Over the last few years, we've had a number of people in my family, my own brother, my stepbrother, friends, co-workers, uh, full-time workers, who are the same age as me that have all passed away in the last two years. And it's a sobering thought as you realize, wow, life is very short. And then I hear about young people who are dying suddenly, unexpectedly. Death comes to us human beings as a result of, as a consequence of our sin. God warned Adam and Eve, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And that instant they started this process of, of decay, of moving towards physical death. And we all cope with it. And everybody in every family has family members that have died. And you can look back in your family history and as far back as you can trace it, there are people who have died. We're coping with physical death, but we're coping with more than physical death. We're coping with spiritual death, which is separation from God. And that's worse. Physical death applies to our earthly existence for a certain number of years. Eternal spiritual death is never, ever ending. Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 that through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and death spread to all men. Can you imagine back in the Garden of Eden originally no disease, no death, no bloodshed? Uh, it's, it's hard to even picture that, isn't it? Uh, it was a perfect world. Instant that sin comes in, the sadness, the family breakdown, the tension between brothers and parents. Murder enters the scene. Suspicion. Jealousy enters. Instantly these things just invade upon this perfect world. Until you and I come to the point that we are right now in 2023. And what do we see around us? We see heartache, bloodshed, hatred, abuse, lies, deceit. Everywhere you look, you see wickedness and violence and, and addiction. And this, this world is just spiraling downward so fast, isn't it? There's an awful lot of bad news around about us. What's the human response to that? We blame God. 
Well, if there was a good, loving God, we wouldn't be suffering in the world. God's saying, wait a minute, I am a good, loving God, but you have chosen the pathway of violence. You have chosen the pathway of darkness. You have chosen the pathway of rebellion. It's not God's fault. It's our human fault because we absolutely continue to refuse to submit to him and acknowledge our sin and acknowledge our failure. We, we refuse to accept the bad news of who and what we are. Individually, as the human race, as society, as countries, as nations, somehow we think that we are strong enough and capable enough and smart enough and educated enough to run our own lives to plan our own uh, uh, destiny upon this earth. Somehow we think that we can craft our families and societies and nations apart from God. How's that going for us? Not too well. Not too well at all. The scripture says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you do, do not hear. Your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversely. No one calls for justice nor pleads for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. And that's from the book of Isaiah chapter 59. The prophet Jeremiah reminds us, the heart, the human heart, your heart, my heart, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That hurts, doesn't it? My heart? No, I can, I can think of people who maybe are in prison who've done really awful things. Well, their heart is, is wicked and deceitful, but not my heart. Yeah, your heart. <laughs> my heart. Right. That's the Bible's uh, view of us. That's the Bible's pronouncement against us. And you say, but, but I don't even want to go there. I don't, don't even want to accept it. If you want the good news... You need to first accept the bad news. Remember this, the Bible is God's truth. The Bible is not just any old book. The Bible is God's revelation to us. His word is truth. And, and if we want to understand truth, we need to come to the scriptures and believe it by faith and accept and receive the word of God. As the Lord looked at humanity, looked at our world, at any point through all human history, even if he looks at us right now, he would be completely justified in saying, you know what? You people want your own way? Go ahead. Just have it. I'm stepping out of the scene here. You don't want me? I'm out of here. He would be justified in, in doing that, wouldn't he? But here's the truth. God so loved the world. That includes you and me. That includes everybody. All people, all nations, all ages. God so loved the world. We are his creation. We are precious to him. Even in our fallenness, even in our worst moments, God looks at us and he has compassion to, towards us. He desires to restore relationship with you and I. Wow. That's awesome. That is absolutely amazing. Why would he want to do that? One word. Grace. Grace. His undeserved favor. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. It simply is. God cares about you. God cares about me. He loves you. He loves me. He feels compassion towards you. I don't know many of you. I don't know what state you're in. Maybe you're sitting here and you look all nice and you're all dressed up. But in your mind, maybe there's a lot of wickedness. Maybe secretly in your life, you're doing all kinds of things that you know your conscience tells you this is not good. This is not right. right? This, this is awful. But you can't break out of it. You're kind of attached and addicted. And so you cover it up and you pretend that everything's okay. You know your own heart. And the Lord knows your, your own heart. Maybe you feel worthless. Maybe you feel like you're beyond help. God loves you, where you are at. He doesn't say, look, first go and clean up your life. Get your act together, then come to me. He says, come to me as you are because you can't clean up your act. You can't restore fellowship with God. You can't undo your sin and rebellion. So come to me as you are. God desires to restore that relationship 
God so loved the world. Well, that's nice that he loved us, but what did he do about it? That he gave his only begotten son. He gave the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus came to this earth as a man, as a servant, as a sacrifice. He went to the cross. He gave his life. He shed his blood as the Lamb of God that we were singing about earlier. He, he gave himself for us. He is the answer. He is the solution. He is salvation. See, salvation is not just something that you believe. Salvation is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is in the person of Jesus whom you receive as your Savior. It's not just a head knowledge. It's not just a philosophy that you buy into. It's not just a religion that you enter into that you do a bunch of stuff and come to church and get baptized and come to the Lord's Supper. And if you say the right things and do the right things and carry a big enough Bible, you're going to get into heaven. No. Salvation is a person. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Have you come to him? Have you asked him to be your savior? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? Have you asked him that his blood covers all of your failure and sin and rebellion? Have you asked him to be your savior? John chapter 1 and verse 14. The word, the Lord Jesus, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. John says, of his fullness have we all received, and grace upon grace. Here's the marvelous thing. God brings us his grace, and he showers his grace upon us, and he multiplies his grace towards us. The law was given through Moses, and the law brought death. The law brings the knowledge of sin. The law brings condemnation. Because what it tells us is, here's the standard. And the standard is 100%. God doesn't accept a 99%. It's 100%. You fail if you get less than 100%. You say, well, who can live up to that? Good question. Answer, nobody. That's the point, right? Nobody can. And sometimes people object to that. And I like to use this illustration. I said, if you were dangling over the cliff with, with a chain, and you're holding on to that chain, that's your only hope. How many links in the chain need to break before you fall? Only one, right? Only one. The law is like that. It's, it's, it's a chain with many, many links. But you break one of those links, you've broken the whole law because it means that you will fall. You will go into the condemnation that you have earned by breaking even one of God's laws, one of his word. And James, book of James reminds us of that. If you have offended in the least point, you're guilty of the whole law of God. Well, you know what? We don't have to worry about having offended in the least. We've offended the great, in the greatest. Because what is the greatest law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That's the greatest. Well, which one of us can say, oh, yeah, 24-7, 365, since the day I was born, I've always loved God perfectly with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. If anybody said that, they would be a fool to even claim that, right? None of us would dare to claim that. We've all then broken the greatest commandment that God has given. And that leaves us in a very difficult position. But the grace of God, but the goodness of God, but the love of God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that amazing? Not while we had you know, cleaned up our act and made ourselves better, turned over a new leaf, become, become more religious. religious. No, he says, while you were lost and hopeless and helpless, you were in a position of enemies of God. You hated God. You didn't want God. In that situation, in that position of mankind, the Lord Jesus loved us. God gave his son for us. Christ died for us. Paul could say in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Doesn't it say that he came to save good people? No. Doesn't it say he came, he came to save church people? No. He came to save Sinners, the ungodly. That's you and me. That's who he came to save. Praise the Lord that he did. Because if he didn't come to save sinners, 
there'd be no hope for me. There'd be absolutely no hope for me. But he came to save the worst of the worst. That's how big his love is. That's how great his grace is. That's how magnificent the provision is that the Lord Jesus made by shedding his blood on the cross. There is no sin too small or too great that he cannot cover, that he cannot forgive. I love the way that Ephesians chapter 2 puts it. In that chapter, it starts out by describing our condition, dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, we're described as being controlled by the sinful patterns of the, the world under the influence of Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We operate in, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. By nature, we were children of wrath. And we say, Oh, that's hard to listen to. That's, that was, that's me. That's us. Right? What, what a, a nasty description of us. But it's true. Right? That's God's description of us. That's the first three verses. Verse 4. But God. But God who is rich in mercy. Because of the great love wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he has raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's a magnificent message. There is no other message in the world that is equal to that. The grace of God to lost human beings. The favor of God, the kindness of God towards rebellious human beings. Wow. 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 That's good news. That's good news. But you see, you see how you, you can't embrace the good news unless you've embraced the bad news. Because if you don't think you're a sinner, why do you need a savior? Then you're just fine. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And that's why we need a savior. How can we be saved? By grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. People say, oh, it sounds so simple. Well, it is in a sense. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But there's decisions to be made. There's commitments to be made in that, isn't it? It's not simply a cerebral agreement or assent with the truth. But it's embracing a person. Remember the, the statement in John chapter 1 and verse 11 and 12? It says, Jesus came to his own and his own didn't receive him. His own people. The Jews, the Israelites, he came to his own people as their Messiah, but they didn't receive him. They rejected him. He came to his own, his own did not receive him. But to as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. You see that? They didn't just believe some facts about him. They received Jesus as their Savior. They entered into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They trusted him to forgive their sins. They trusted him as their Messiah and Savior. And they committed themselves to him as their Lord. That's good news. Wonderful news. The hymn writer said, Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed. The price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. Savior. I praise him for the cleansing blood. What a wonderful Savior that reconciled my, reconciled my soul to God. What a wonderful Savior. He cleansed my heart from all its sin. What a wonderful Savior. And now he reigns and rules therein. What a wonderful Savior. And now he walks beside me in the way. What a wonderful Savior. He keeps me faithful day by day. What a wonderful Savior. He gives me overcoming power. What a wonderful Savior. And he gives me triumph in each trying hour. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Can you say that this morning? Are you just religious? Come to church? 
and then you do your own thing the rest of the time? Or are you truly walking with the Lord Jesus? Do you know him and the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection working in your life? Do you just have a profession of faith? Or are you a genuine believer born again by the Holy Spirit, walking, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? And you know his power, you know his presence, you know the triumph of, of, of his indwelling power, carrying you through day by day, helping you to overcome specific areas of sin and failure in your life, have, helping you to deal with the ups and downs of your emotions, helping you to deal with the fear that is in the world, the anxiety that is in the world because of all the the stuff that's happening politically, with the, all that's happening in the world in terms of the immorality and the attacks against Christians, in the midst of all of that, do you have the peace of God guarding your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your King, as your Lord? And I issue that challenge today. If you, if you don't know Him, if you're not sure, Make sure today, don't leave this building today until you have truly settled that account, until you have settled this question, are you in Christ? Do you belong to him? Do you know him? Are you saved? Are you his child? Let's just pray and then I'll make a few comments after I've prayed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the power of your word which speaks so deeply to our souls Thank you for the, the amazing provision that you have made for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross, for the blood that was shed. Thank you for the salvation that you have made available to us. And I do pray and ask that if there's anybody here who perhaps is unsure of their spiritual and eternal state, that they would not leave today until they make sure of that, until they close in with you, until they indeed submit to you, draw near and experience the wonderful peace with God that comes, reconciliation, forgiveness, and eternal life. Thank you for this assembly. Thank you how special it is to my own heart and, and to those who gather here. We pray your blessing, your encouragement upon this assembly, that your spirit would work day by day, and that this assembly would, would stand strong in you and in your mighty power, clothed in the armor of God, uh, standing solidly on the word of God, unashamed of the truth. You would strengthen those who are in leadership here to be faithful shepherds. Father, I just thank you for this time together. Thank you for the good news of the gospel.